Hello, I'm Bill McNally. Welcome to America's Future. My guest today is, for the second time, Frank Knowlton. He is Lieutenant Commander, retired from the United States Navy. He was previously on my show talking about his experience in the uh, Korean War. And today, he's for the History Project, again, the Veterans History Project, which uh, I hope Jim can put that on the screen where you can find more about it. We're going to be talking about some special subjects and his experience in Tokyo, Japan. Welcome again, uh, Mr. Knowlton. Thank you. Bill, it's a pleasure. <clears throat> and I love the fact that this is a future show and we're doing the thing that puts the future into perspective because we're dealing with the past that preordains what the future will bear. Good point. Uh, I'd like to explain one of the most teachable moments I have had in my lifetime. And as you had mentioned on the previous show, you've been around 80 years? And the answer is yes. And the most teachable moment in that 80 years occurred in Tokyo in February of 1951. It was a meeting that was by happenstance. The manager of the Gozoku Kaikan, which is the army billet for senior, very important people um, that would come from the states and various other countries. And the manager of that facility was a retired admiral who had been taken off active duty during World War II because he was very seriously injured in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And he was burned over about 60% of his body and he lost his right leg at the knee. After he had recovered from the burns and the injury, he was, and he could not go back aboard ship because of his injuries and such, he was asked to join the Emperor of Japan's small military contingent that he had uh, to keep himself informed. He knew that as the Emperor, he was responsible for Japan in the full circumstance of everything, whereas his military commander basically was responsible for the external war that was being waged as well as for uh, the defense of the homeland. The admiral, while he was on that staff, was asked to do a study with the other six people that were uh, together there for the emperor as advisors. And that study came up with some very, very interesting figures. And the study basically said that if Japan was invaded, uh, approx they estimated that approximately six million of those invading Japan would be killed. In addition to that, he said, in defense of the country, it would probably be about 13 to 15 million Japanese would die in defense of their country. Now, when you consider that this was now 19... 44, um, you've got to understand that Japan had been at war for over five years at that time uh, with the Chinese, with the Manchurians, and with a number of, in other words, they had a major war going on the Chinese continent. And they had had over 1.2 million casualties there. Uh, they had just short of a million casualties with U.S. forces and, and the Guadalcanals and the, and the battles on New Guinea and all the rest of it and uh, the battles uh, with Indonesia and, and, and so on, all, all during the South Pacific campaign. So with casualties then for Japan running about two point some million, and them looking at uh, a loss of approximately 15 million 
13 to 15 million in defense of their country if they had to defend it against an invasion, and uh, killing 6 million of those attacking it. The total cost of the war to Japan at that time would be somewhere in the area of almost mm, 15 million, 16, 17 million. Okay? And so with that study in hand, uh, the Emperor of Japan said uh, we should start discussing peace terms with America. And because the Soviet Union still had a, a relationship with Japan, because they were not at war with Japan at the time, they were contacted through their embassy there in Tokyo uh, to contact America and say, we would like to talk about negotiating a settlement. So the, the Japanese, they wanted to go through the Russians Just and have the Russians contact us. us. Yeah. And then have a meeting. Have a meeting to stop the war. That's right. Before the bomb before the bomb. We didn't know anything about that because Russia never talked to us. Because Russia's interest was in taking some of Japanese territory, and they knew while the war was going on, they could do it legitimately with our concurrence. Mm. So put it all together, and you now have a situation where uh, something had to be done. But we didn't know it, so we progressed with our plans to try to prevent the invasion from having to take place and doing it with the atom bombs. So Hiroshima occurred. Now Hiroshima, it's a relatively small city. It has no important impact on the, on the um, economy of Japan in its war effort. There was relatively little war effort activity out of that area. And it was isolated. And suddenly, here goes a bomb. It was an air burst weapon. It burst up somewhere in the area of, say, six to 10,000 feet, let's say. And uh, it had very little residue and residual radiation because it was an air burst. It was also very effective because of the type of constructions the Japanese used. The military commander of Japan tried to indicate to the people of Japan that this could not possibly be the action of the United States, and it was probably a meteorite that had come mm -hmm. down and hit the area and so on. And, and don't think America could do something like this. It's too horrendous. It's too everything. Um, and, and his purpose of trying to convince the people that it was a meteorite was for, he didn't want what? What was the? The people to think they had to capitulate. Okay. Okay. He wanted right. them to fight on. Yeah, okay. Right. So. so, what the heck happens, but we then dropped leaflets the next day that said Nagasaki is going to have the same thing happen to it as the first particular occurrence. So in other words, they're telling the people that we did it. That's we, right. The United States did And it. we're going to continue to do it. Right. <clears throat> so Nagasaki goes off, again, an airburst, two, very little residual radiation in a relatively short period of time. You can get into the area and start uh, taking out uh, wounded and all the rest of it. And um, so with those two weapons having gone off, the military committee said to the emperor again, you have got to go directly to the United States and tell them that we want to talk terms. He did that. But there was a slight revolution in the Imperial Guard who took control away from the emperor and the people under his control. And the emperor was not allowed to make his declaration and to broadcast his appeal uh, for negotiation and so on. And that went on for somewhere in the area of uh, 36 to 40 hours. And then the emperor was able to get uh, his recording released, and Japan was now talking capitulation. What America didn't know is that the communist element in America um, had control that we didn't understand. For instance, they had the control 
to actually defeat Chiang Kai-shek from fighting the communists. They wanted uh, our people, our communists in the United States, called New World Order, uh, wanted the communists to take over China. And as a result, our military and our OSS, our intelligence service, actually um, saw to it that the materials that the Japanese surrendered and such uh, would all be turned over to the communists rather than to the nationalists. And we took those things that we were going to supply the nationalists, we took them with us when we headed back to Burma. So put the whole thing together. Uh, the admiral that I'm talking to about this whole process said, the thing that still is not completely understandable to me is why you picked relatively isolated cities that had no real significance to Japan and no real damage to us because we only lost somewhere in the area of, say, 250, 300,000 people versus we're talking, what, 20 million? He said, why did... You mean the, 20 million that... That, that would we, have occurred if, if they... If hit the right cities. No, if oh. we had... In actually the, invaded, invaded the country. Okay. All right. They had not capitulated. And so therefore, he said, I, he said, if we, the Japanese, had had those atom bombs, we would not have been as considerate right. as you were in America of hitting isolated cities with air bursts with very little residual radiation rather than make something uh, you know, unhabitable for 20 years. Um, he says, you didn't do any of that. He said, you did something to tell us that you had a capability of destroying us without invading us. And he said, and you did it in such a way that you really didn't damage our country very much. And you prevented the loss of probably somewhere in the area of the loss of 20 million people with nothing gained except the further destruction right, of which Japan. Which would have taken them hundreds of years to rebuild their population if they lost that many because they that, didn't. That's right. Yeah. 135 to 150 years to get back their pre-war population. Right. Frank, I just wanted to mention something here because in the beginning of the program I just realized, but it's okay, that the viewers may not have uh, known your credentials. I just wanted to go over that. You're, you're a retired commander from the Navy and you went to the uh, aviation midship program where you enlisted at 90 Church Street in New York City. You went down to Pensacola, Florida. You trained there for two years. You got your aviator wings and then you went off as we said you were you were part of uh, you were assigned to become Admiral Joy's flag pilot. And one of his three one flags. Of his, one of his three pilots which gave you the opportunity not only to meet Admiral Joy but to meet General MacArthur because he wanted to fly on Admiral Joy's plane, and you flew around with Admiral Joy during the Incheon landing. You watched it. Yes. Circle it. Okay. And then I know now you have this story that we go into. Go ahead from there. Uh, um, all of the things that happened to me uh, have been uh, sort of by the grace of God. Uh, I have been placed in positions where when I learn that everything of a military nature that comes out of the United Nations is basically run by the Soviet Union, um, it, it, to me the people that did that are worse than communists. They're, they're, they're total traitors to our country and they created something that is on its way to actually trying to take control of our country. And we as citizens have got to realize that the blood that has been given in one, giving us our country in the first revolution of revolutions, us against the British, who are the strongest nation in the world and we were just a bunch of guys out in the woods with muskets. And uh, all of these things that I'm talking about now are by people who actually believe in America and believe in what we're doing. And um, MacArthur's comment was so appropriate but so misunderstood by most when he said, 
If it's good for the United States, I do it. And if it's not good for the United States, I don't. And he was so considerate of his manpower and his people that he wouldn't allow operations to take place if it, he thought that one person would be injured over those that might be injured uh, to get things accomplished. Right. You were going to go into that story about the painting, right? Well, the painting actually, do we have time to go into yeah. that? Okay. Um, General MacArthur was so highly considered by the Emperor of Japan for what he did, not only in winning the war with Japan, but in actually helping Japan restore itself after the war, that he wanted MacArthur's picture in sort of the rogues gallery leading to the Imperial Palace view, uh, room where everything took place, and he wanted to put MacArthur's picture up there with other emperors of Japan. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the imperial artist that was assigned to do the job painted MacArthur but was uh, unhappy with his picture because MacArthur has one ear. The painter was... The, was, the painter was a Japanese well, unhappy. painter. I mean, he was unhappy. Happy, Not MacArthur. No. No, okay. The, the painter was unhappy, unhappy with the picture because MacArthur has one ear higher than the other, mm -hmm. which I have one ear higher than the other. And uh, he didn't get MacArthur's eyes properly in his mind as the painter. And so, therefore, he wasn't going to let MacArthur see it or the emperor see it. Mm. So, Colonel Story... Um, Colonel Story, uh, I considered a poor pilot and uh, a political hack. Uh, and um, he had asked that his picture be painted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nakamura came over and took one look at Colonel Story and says, no, I not paint him. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Colonel Story is a good red-blooded young American, says, get that damn Jap out of here. He says he's no damn good anyway. Da 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 da. And so, Mr. Nakamura, the Japanese imperial painter, is walking out of the building uh, towards the beginning of the building, and he looks over and he sees me working at my desk, and uh, my desk faced the door. Yeah. And he said to the major escorting him out, "I want to paint him." <laughs> wow. So, he saw the MacArthur profile. Right? Yeah, he, one ear higher than the other and the eyes. So what happens, Buddy comes in and says, I want to paint you. Hmm. So needless to say, I'm an ensign, wet behind both ears. Uh, I asked him how much. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't he, know. I didn't, didn't know. know his credentials. No, I didn't no. know his credentials. I didn't know him from Adam or Eve. Uh, so as a result, um, I said, for $50, I'll let you paint my picture, because I'd like to have a picture. And he said, OK, 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 one start. Well, it took about five months to get the sittings in to do it, wow. because I was flying so much. And so finally, it's finished. Mr. Nakamura, the painter, is now happy enough to go back and modify MacArthur's painting to low low key the year that's a little too high mm -hmm. and makes it sort of look funny and he was able to correct his eyes and so as a result of this i ended up with a painting by the imperial artist who only painted two caucasians in his entire lifetime no kid, really just you Just and MacArthur. MacArthur. <laughs> so I have a lovely how, no, picture in my living room. How, where did you get the frame for it? Oh, the frame. We went to about, I'd say, 10, 12 frame shops, and Mr. Nakamura was looking at frames in relation to what he had painted. And he finally found what he was looking for. And he said, OK, I want this specific frame, and I want it this specific size and so, so on. And the, needless to say, the frame maker said, you know, yes, sir. So when we go back and we get the frame, 
And Mr. Nakamura has taken the painting with him. They put it in, they do all the tic-tac-toe and uh, all the things Japanese do to put pictures together. And Mr. Nakamura was very happy, and the Japanese man who made the frame was very happy. And Mr. Nakamura said, what is the price? And the man said, for the privilege of having the imperial painter of the emperor use my frame, there is no charge. Wow. And I thought, wow. Hmm. In order to thank him, I said to Mr. Nakamura, what can I do to thank him? He said, well, he's a very hardworking, very capable painter, but he doesn't really probably have a good kimono set, which is, consists of about four to six different robes and so on down the line. So I said to Mr. Nakamura, would you have your tailor go and provide him with an appropriate set of kimonos? And so Mr. Nakamura did it. But I am a sneaky little rascal, and that gave me Mr. Nakamura's um, tailor information and mm. telephone number. And then I had a kimono set for Mr. Nakamura made and I told the tailor through an interpreter that I wanted it to be the best kimono he had ever made in wow. his life, not to exceed what the emperor might wear, but one step down. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how much a kimono set really cost. But I just happened to have, because I was a single person and I didn't spend very much money, uh, I just happened to have the $600 that it cost. Wow. And so Mr. Nakamura, in turn, went back to his studio one day, and there was a box there. And he had a kimono that stops just about all kimonos. No kidding. And so this is the way it ended up. Now, so as we, as we stand today, where are those two paintings by this these two Caucasian paintings by Na Nakamura. One is in the the um, entryway into the Imperial Hearing Room. Still there room. today. MacArthur's picture is there in that line, right. in an appropriate position. Mm -hmm. And the other is in Five Cody Circle, Biddeford, Maine, on the wall of my living room. Beautiful. And I am a very privileged person to have such uh, an honor. Um, another few um, things that occurred uh, with my time there in Japan, particularly with MacArthur, um, he was so honored and so revered by the Japanese public that when, and by the way, I'll go back to something I previously said and correct it. Okay, wait a minute. I yeah. just got an idea. You know, we've got to take that painting to the Antiques Row show sometime. Really? Get it appraised. Yeah. Really? Right. Would that be exciting? Oh, very. All right. Yeah, we'd love to. Okay. So, what happens, but um, he was so revered and so appreciated by those who really understood who he was, what he was, and what was done. Um, that um, it, was, it was touching because as he left Tokyo to come back to the United States, it was estimated that almost four million people came out between Tokyo and Haneda wow. to wave little American and Japanese flags and we have an American that normally is considered a military person who actually captured a country on his reputation and his performance. So the people that are putting Americans down, one, haven't heard that Japanese admiral who said, if we had had the bombs, it would have been much worse in America than when you had the bombs and you did it in a way that didn't hurt us, but helped us not have an invasion. In addition to which, MacArthur, 
when sitting in an aircraft, and I, I just happened to have brought back some materials that were desired by both uh, MacArthur and Admiral Joy, and uh, I can remember uh, MacArthur saying to Admiral Joy, um, uh, it's Turner Joy for first names. Uh, Turner uh, was told by MacArthur, he said, Turner, last night I sent a Twix, the equivalent of a fax, uh, back to the president and asked to be relieved. Turner Joy said, if you did that, I'm going to kick you right square in the, um, uh, and he named the uh, particular anatomy that he was going to deal with. And he said, do you know how happy that's going to make those idiots in Washington? And MacArthur said, my oath of office said that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and I will not violate my oath of office. And my oath of office says I will not contact politicians with military matters. And he said, and I did. I wrote letters, and I said, in order to prevent the Chinese from entering the Korean War, I had to use three nuclear weapons to destroy the, the materials. I think we got a little time left. I, I've got one question. You tell me if you can relate this. I did hear an incident about you and MacArthur face to face over something about a parachute. Is that true? Yes. MacArthur said, I don't jump out of aircraft. Right. And he says, if anything happens, he says, land it in the water and we'll take it from there. And I said, well, my father always said that you thought you could walk on the water, but I said, I don't think you can. <laughs> no, but did he, he didn't wear the... the uh, he didn't want to wear the chute. But I know. But so I told him he doesn't have to put it on. We would put it on him. Oh. I said, <laughs> our chief steward's mate, who is the rear turret gunner, if he comes up to strap you up, he was the lightweight boxer in the Pacific Fleet for a number of years, and he will go. And I said, in addition to which, when he releases the door and it leaves, he's going to take and grab you by your chest straps and pull you out, and you're going to leave head first. MacArthur says, sounds more exciting all the time. <laughs> and I said, well, you have a choice. When the horizontal stabilizer of this aircraft comes by, it might hit you if you don't go down immediately. And, and we would much rather that your ankles come off then your neck be severed and that your head go separate from the body. Right. And he said, and, and Chief Stewart here, uh, he, he'll take care of things. I said, you just stand up and put your arms out when he tells you and everything else will go like clockwork. Really? So MacArthur said, you're worse than your father. <laughs> I was going to say, that was my next question. MacArthur knew your father. Very well. Really? My father had the joy of serving him almost from day one really? in the Pacific War. That is fantastic. Okay, Mr. Knowlton, I really appreciate this, this story, and I appreciate it again for you taking the time out to tell your story about a veteran, and <clears throat> surely give all my thanks for your saving our country. And once again, let me uh, thank our guests for coming, Edgar Sargent, Terry Sargent from Merrimack, Mass., Proud to have you here. Thank the uh, Windham Cable Television and uh, thank the uh, crew. And thank you, the viewer, for watching. <laughs>